In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our hymn in your green hymnal number 487.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Won't you be seated for the last first reading for this is second Sunday in Lent comes from Genesis reading in the 17th chapter. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and you will make, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell to his face, and God said to him, As for thee, this is my covenant with you. You shall be an ancestor of the multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offsprings after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you should not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her name. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Here ends the first reading. The second reading for this morning comes from Second Romans, reading in the fourth chapter. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to his inheritance of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he was the father of all of us, as it was written, I have made you my father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he, he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls unto the existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old. For when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him whether waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his face as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. Here reigns the second reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. St. Mark writes, 
Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Won't you be seated? Do we have anybody coming down for the children's sermon? I wasn't sure if we were going to have one for the children's sermon or two, but we'll go with one. How are you today? Good. Okay. I'm going to show you some things, and our theme is we're going to talk about things that may be hard. Okay? So, big enough, this might be easy for you, but so there are a bunch of hard things that we're called upon to do in our life. Sometimes, sometimes it's learning our letters. Sometimes it's working with a jigsaw puzzle. Whether it's kind of a big jigsaw puzzle. Do you want to play with that? It's kind of soft. Sometimes it's these harder jigsaw puzzles. I confess I'm not very good at jigsaw puzzles, so some things are hard. On your way out in the back, you can grab Paul and, and uh, Don. There should be a little pile of papers that about that size. And these are, can you find 16 books in the Bible? I got to tell you, this, this one's fairly challenging. So you can grab one on the way out. We have a lot of things that we have to do in life that are hard. but. Usually when we get something that's fairly hard, we get help. There are parents, there are teachers, and when God sends us to do something that's really, really hard, God's there to help. Okay? So that's the lesson I want you to take away from this is when you're doing something, you do this stuff, God's there to help you. Okay? together and we're going to say a prayer. God, many things in our life are hard. Many things are challenging and difficult. We ask you to walk with us and help us to accomplish all that we need to in our life. For we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. So before you go, I'm going to send you up and these, these are two mysteries, and you can give them right up there. When you go right up, you can give them to the adults, okay? Thanks for coming down. And for the rest of you, the little half sheets that look like this, and 
They're on the ushers bench. By the way, it's, it's really a lot of fun to do. But it's important to remember that no matter what we're doing in life that's hard, God is walking with us. I invite you again to pray with me. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Names have a meaning. We may not necessarily know the meaning of our names, but most names, personal names, have a meaning. For instance, the name Terence means smooth, coming from its Latin root. It also has roots in India, where it means instigator. Now, as I remember being a toddler, I'm pretty sure that that's what my mother thought of me when I was two, three, four, and five. Walsh is an Irish name that means foreigner. And it really comes from the time of the Norman conquest of the British Isles. Now, it can mean a foreigner from specifically the country of Wales, or it can just mean a foreign traveler. The common names you might have, Joseph, Richard, William, Susan, Joyce, Elizabeth, all these names have a meaning. Now, maybe your parents picked out a name for you just because they liked the name, or maybe they picked out that name because they hoped that you would grow into the meaning of the name. If you were to go before Jesus Christ, and if Jesus asked you what new name you would like, what name would you prefer? Now, I'm thinking not so much about you know, the common names that we all have, but the meaning behind it. Maybe um, the name that you would like would be something like person of love person of integrity. There are lots of names that we might be asked for. Or to put the question another way, what name do you think that Jesus Christ would give to you based on where you're going in your life? Names are part of God's covenant with Abram and Sarai, that is, Abraham and Sarah. Now, covenant is like a contract, except that when God wants to make a contract with you, God makes you an offer that you cannot refuse. Or certainly an offer that you don't want to refuse. God makes the covenant with Abraham and Sarah that they will become the parents of many nations. God will make them fruitful. God will be their God, and they will be God's people. And in the Bible, names have power. To know someone's name is to have power over them. When Jacob wrestles with God, this is in Genesis chapter 32, Jacob asks God, what is your name? God replies to Jacob, why is it that you ask my name? Which God does not want to give at that moment because to know God's name would be to have power over God. God gives Abram and Sarai a new name because Abram and Sarai are about to take on a new mission for God. Now, God's covenant with Abram and Sarai is years and years old, but they're now getting close to the fulfillment of that covenant, which is the birth of the baby Isaac. God will now give Abram and Sarai the baby that has been long promised. Now that Abram and Sarai are about to become parents, and to become the parents not only of Isaac, but the parents of a great many nations, Abram and Sarai are given new names. Abram becomes Abraham. The exalted father becomes the father of a multitude, or the father of many nations. Sarai means my lady, whereas Sarah means princess. Not just princess to Abraham's family, but the multitude of nations that will proceed from Abraham and Sarah. Now we should emphasize that 
Abraham and Sarah are not perfect people. Abraham could be quite the coward. Every time they went to a new place, Abraham would introduce himself as Sarah's brother because Sarah was quite something to look at, and Abraham was always afraid he was going to get killed and somebody would take Sarah to be their wife. Sarah gives Abraham her servant Hagar as a substitute childbearer. Not the kind of thing that one person should do for another. Abraham and Sarah, Sarah are far from perfect. But God uses Abraham and Sarah to create the multitude of nations that would worship God and ultimately welcome Jesus Christ. Well, we have other examples. In the Old Testament, Jacob is born to Isaac and his name, and his name means he who grasps by the heel. He came right behind his older brother. Jacob is renamed Israel, which means he strives with man and God. In the New Testament, Jesus renamed Simon, a name that means one who hears, to the Hebrew name Cephas and the Greek name Peter, which means rock. Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, will be the rock-solid confession upon which the church is built. The man of Judah who persecutes the church, Saul, will be called by Jesus to follow. Saul, a Hebrew name, will be better known as Paul, a Greek name, for Paul will go out into the Greek world to preach the good news. God sends each of us out into the world to make a difference, perhaps inside the church, perhaps in our families, perhaps in our workplace, perhaps by our volunteer work. What name might God give you? Or, or what name would you ask God to give you? I had some thoughts for me, things that are aspirational. Peacekeeper. Person who keeps his word. Person of prayer. God follower. What name might God give you? What name would you like to be known by? God has a covenant with each of us. God will be our God and we will be God's people. We will be the disciples of God. And when we fail, when we come up short, we can rise again to ask God's forgiveness and God's strength. God has made a covenant with you. God sent Jesus Christ to be your good shepherd. What name might God give you? What name would you like to live into? Let me make a slight diversion here. Why in heck are we saying the Nicene Creed during Lent? It's less familiar. Most people can say the Apostles' Creed by memory. The Nicene Creed takes a little bit more time and it takes up more space in the bulletin. Why don't we just stick with the Apostles' Creed and make it easy? Reciting one of the creeds is the response to the proclamation of God's word during the first portion of the worship service. God's word is proclaimed in the whole worship service, including the lessons from the Bible and the sermon. The Apostles' Creed developed very, very early in the church. It was a profession of faith that would be said just before a child, an older child or an adult was baptized, or by the parents on behalf of a younger child who was to be baptized. To this day, we teach the Apostles' Creed as the summary of our faith, especially in confirmation. The Apostles' Creed begins with the word, I, because it's a personal profession. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Well, the Apostles' Creed begins very shortly after Jesus' resurrection. The Nicene Creed was written for the Council of Nicaea, which met in the year 325, so about 300 years later. 
The Council of Nicaea was called to resolve questions which were disturbing Christians because of uncertainties that the Apostles' Creed did not resolve. Well, the first section about God the Father is pretty much the same length because everybody agreed about who God the Father is. The second and third sections about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are longer, which give us deeper insight into Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed begins with the word we because it's about what the church believes together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty. We alternate these creeds through this, the season so that we can be familiar with both. The Apostles of the Nicene Creed are not some unique Lutheran thing. In fact, they far predate Martin Luther. The Roman Catholic, Episcopal, Methodist, United Church of Christ, other churches, we all share the Apostles and the Nicene Creed, and we alternate them so that you can be familiar with both. The Nicene Creed is a bit longer, but it's important to the faithfulness of the church. And the creeds help us to answer the question, what name would Jesus give you? What name would you like to suggest for Jesus to bestow upon you? Amen. Our hymn is number 500 in your green book. Would you please join us? heaven and earth, 
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite I invite you to be seated for music at the offering.
I invite you to rise for the offertory prayer and for the prayers of intercession. Together we pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made for the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. We turn to you for meaning, holy God. Nurture in your children the gifts of the Spirit poured out in baptism, and let the mind of Christ guide the church. Give wisdom and discernment to our bishops, pastors, deacons, teachers, and leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We turn to you for renewal. Save lives and ecosystems threatened by pollution and a changing climate. Cleanse the earth's waters and restore the soil. Preserve rainforests, deserts, and wildlife that generations to come may cherish your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We turn to you for justice. Uphold the worth and dignity of every person, especially any who has experienced hatred and rejection. Bring justice to victims of crime. Bind up the wounds inflicted by violence. Guide all who investigate and prosecute crime and uphold employees of our prison system. Rehabilitate those convicted of committing crime. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We turn to you for healing. Send compassionate helpers to any who suffer because of war and violence. Shelter unhoused people. Befriend those who are lonely. Bring hope to any in despair and console the bereaved. Lord, in your mercy, we turn to you for purpose. Remind us of your faithfulness to this congregation. Increase our trust in your guidance and keep us near the cross. Grant that our acts of service will express Christ's sacrificial love. Send us new Christians to guide and mentor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We turn to you for peace. We honor the saints who have lived in service to others including Elizabeth Feedy, deaconess, whom we commemorate today. Inspire us by their example until you gather us into your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our hymn number 231. 